Mason University. TOPS is organized by C. Shang from The Ohio State University, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and me. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and com comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shang from The Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we kick off our spring 2023 season with a single paper presentation by Michael Pascal entitled Effects of E-Cigarette Minimum Legal Sales Ages on Used Tobacco Use in the U.S. Michael Pascal is a health economist and an associate professor in the Department of Economics at Georgia State University. The primary focus of his research is to identify causal effects of health policy changes using survey and administrative data sources. He graduated with a PhD in economics in 2012 and has since published 65 peer reviewed papers in journals such as New England Journal of Medicine, Health Affairs, Journal of Health Economics, Journal of Human Resources, American Journal of Public Health, Tobacco Control and Addiction. In particular, Dr. Pesco has published over 20 e-cigarette policy evaluation papers he is currently founded as PI of multiple R1s from the National Institutes of Health and through a researcher, a research scholar grant from the American Cancer Society. He is a member of the Canadian Scientific Advisory Board on vaping products. Our discussion today is Scott Adams, a professor of economics at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Dr. Michael Pasco, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you. I am trying to share my screen, um, but I'm not able to. I can't do it now. Great. Thank you. Okay. Can everybody see my slides okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Tops, for having me today. Uh, thank you to uh, those of you that are attending. I'm excited to present this um, recently uh, published uh, paper today in uh, the Journal of Risk and Uncertainty. Um, the work was funded by the National Institutes of Health through an R01 and from the University of Kentucky's Institute for the Study of Free Enterprise. Um, TOPS uh, asks us to list any tobacco-related funding over the past 10 years. Um, you can see that uh, this funding comes from uh, advocacy or public health related organizations. I have never been funded directly or indirectly by the tobacco industry. Uh, the NIH uh, standard disclosure applies. Um, the work is my own and uh, is not the um, responsibility of the NIH. So uh, some background information um, that many of you are, are more familiar with than, than me. Um, but e-cigarettes were first imported uh, into the United States in 2006. Um, they originally sold online in specialty shops, and around 2010, that's when they that's when we started to observe them in uh, store shelves. Um, but people had access to them um, before 2010 when they started to appear on store shelves. And I'm always surprised by the relatively high rates of use uh, in the early years. 3.3% um, of all school attending youth grade six plus and 12.2% of adult smokers had already used e-cigarettes at some point by 2011. So the e-cigarettes were not immediately classified as a tobacco product in the United States. And that created some issues because many states had tobacco, they all had tobacco minimum legal sales ages on the books. These are laws that prevent retailers from selling to underage youth and can fine the retailers if they do. 
so when e-cigarettes came along, if they weren't a tobacco product, uh, then it was a loophole that, and they could be legally sold in, in most states and the states had to actively do something to uh, prevent that from happening. Uh, some states, they issued administrative rulings. They determined that their statutes were, were um, uh, vague enough that they could, in, they could cover e-cigarettes under the existing statute. Other states had to pass new legislation to include e-cigarettes as covered under these products. And so there's variation in the adoption of these laws over time that can be used um, in a natural experiment style, uh, a study design. Um, the FDA then they deemed e-cigarettes to be a tobacco product in August 2016, following a, a lengthy process. Um, by that point in time, only two states had not yet adopted e-cigarette MLSAs. And so the federal classification of e-cigarettes as a tobacco product then caused um, uh, the um, e-cigarettes to be covered under those states as well. Um, so these, this was the first regulation that was widely adopted uh, across all the states. Um, uh, and so it's interesting to, to, to study this uh, uh, empirically um, because it provides some of our, our, our first ability to use quasi-experimental methods uh, to study what was going on in the early e-cigarette years. Um, you can see kind of the variation in these laws over time. Five states adopted these by 2010, uh, 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 seven uh, states by 2011, and then it really started to pick up steam in, in 2012 and, and onward. And as I mentioned, by the time the federal law came into place in August 2016, only two states had not yet adopted these laws. So um, in terms of first stage evidence, the strongest study actually comes from Canada uh, on this. Um, and they had the same similar issue in which the provinces had to adopt the minimum legal sales age laws um, uh, uh, over time, and they also had staggered adoption as well. And um, one paper uses Canadian data on e-cigarette use from 2013 to 17 to study province level e-cigarette uh, minimum legal sales age law adoptions. Um, and they used a two-way fixed effect uh, models. Um, and these are strong models, right? They remove omitted variable bias from national time varying sources and province specific time invariant uh, sources. Um, so a great study designed to reduce uh, confounding that would otherwise uh, uh, be, be occurring. Um, and they found in this study that e-cigarette MLSAs uh, reduced e-cigarette use among youth by 4.3 percentage points. Um, that was approximately a 50% reduction. Um, they also found evidence that it reduced the belief that regular e-cigarette use poses no harm, and it increased self-reported greater difficulty in obtaining e-cigarettes. Um, the study, however, did not look at all at cigarette use. So the USA-specific studies have really been hampered in producing really strong first-stage evidence because most survey data sources did not start adding e-cigarette use questions until, um, until uh, uh, much uh, later. Um, and uh, there are two studies that attempt to provide some use data available at the time uh, in the best way that they could. They have single wave of data um, with e-cigarette use questions and two studies find suggestive evidence that the MLSAs reduced e-cigarette use uh, using a cross-sectional, a largely cross-sectional uh, uh, design. Uh, Dave et al. 2019 found e-cigarette MLSAs reduced ever use of e-cigarettes by 4.3 percentage points and current e-cigarette use by 0 0.9 percentage points. And um, uh, Abuka and Adams, um, 2017, they find that e-cigarette MLSAs reduce current e-cigarette use among underage 12th graders by 10.2 percentage points. So some evidence um, that the, the laws are reducing uh, e-cigarette use, though it would be nice um, if greater data were available to uh, go back and try to reestablish that relationship. Could um, e-cigarette MLSAs then affect use cigarette use? Um, how is, what is the, the, um, the, the theory to think about here? Well, uh, individuals make consumption choices based on their preferences and relative ease of obtaining different products uh, that could include prices and access, for example. Um, and so in the, the, the period of time in which e-cigarette MLSAs were not in place, some individuals may have used e-cigarettes instead of cigarettes on account of greater availability, even if they had a stronger preference for, for cigarettes. So then when the e-cigarette MLSAs came and they reduced that accessibility benefit, um, of e-cigarettes relative to cigarettes, at that point, individuals might have fallen onto their, their preferences, which, would, which may have been to, to smoke rather than to, to vape. Um, so in that way, um, we may find increases in 
e-cigarette MLSC laws on cigarette use. However, e-cigarette MLSC laws could also reduce cigarette use if e-cigarettes are a gateway to combustible use. And if the e-cigarette MLSC, by closing access to e-cigarettes, if that stopped people from otherwise going down the gateway path. So it's a, an empirical question um, whether e-cigarette MLSC laws would increase or decrease smoking. So cigarette use is it's an easier thing to study um, because the data had existed for much longer than uh, e-cigarette use in all of the various national USA surveys. Um, so three studies uh, estimate the effect of e-cigarette MLSA laws on a general population of teenagers. Um, they use national survey on drug use and health data and youth risk behavior surveillance system data. And the three studies found um, an increase of a cigarette use of about 0.8 to 1.0 percentage point due to the e-cigarette MLSA law. Um, and two, two way fixed effect studies then uh, explored the effect of e-cigarette MLSA laws on subgroups of youth. Uh, one focuses on high school seniors, underage high school seniors, and they find a 2.0 uh, percentage point decrease in um, uh, cigarette use. And then another uses birth record data for rural pregnant teenagers, and they find a 0.8 percentage point increase in prenatal smoking due to the e-cigarette MLSA law. So uh, there's five uh, studies out there in this literature. Later on, I'm going I'm to talk about a new study that contributes to this literature, and then I'm going to go back and synthesize uh, what do we know from all of these studies of trying to um, calculate an average um, uh, effect of what we believe this policy is having on, on cigarette use. So further background, um, there is a recent large and unexpected decline in youth uh, cigarette use. In 2012, Surgeon General Report, Secretary of Health Kathleen Sebelius said youth smoking rates declines have stalled. In 2009, Healthy People 2020, committee met and they set a goal of a 16% youth smoking rate by 2019. Um, it was at 19.5% in 2009. And much to everybody's surprise, I think, when 2019 came around, we had a 6% youth smoking rate. So we crushed the Healthy People 2020 objective by approximately 400%. Um, so the Urbis data uh, is another way that we can look to see if smoking changes have been uh, reduced in unexpected ways recently. Um, and if we use a two-year, um, uh, look at two-year changes in, in smoking rates, um, current smoking uh, reduction succeeded 30% in 2015 and 2019, and daily smoking reduction succeeded 40% in these years. And using a percent change over the prior two years, that might be a useful way to uh, uh, get at it being harder to achieve smoking reductions when smoking rates are lower than when smoking rates are higher due to hardening of smokers. And here's some graphical um, uh, evidence on that. With the red line, this is Urbis data and showing percent change in the prior two year periods and use smoking rates. The red line shows when e-cigarettes were first available online. The purple line shows when e-cigarettes were first available on retail shelves. Um, and if I, look to the right of the purple line, I see some large negative numbers over there that are larger than any of the numbers in previous time periods, um, suggesting that the, the two-year change in, in current and daily smoking um, uh, was larger in uh, 2015 and 2019 during the e-cigarette decade uh, versus um, anything that we've seen uh, since uh, uh, 1993. So that also is pro possibly provide some suggestive evidence that something recently is going on in the e-cigarette decade to be reducing youth smoking. Could that be e-cigarette availability? Uh, that is an open question. They, these declines don't seem to be fully explained by tobacco control policies of changing uh, uh, demographics or um, uh, other tobacco control policies according to Sim Smoke model. Um, there's also some evidence that cigarette tax responsiveness has declined in recent years. So that doesn't seem to be the likely explanation either. Tobacco 21 is a possibility. Uh, there are a number of studies to find that Tobacco 21 was, um, did sharply reduce um, youth cigarette use. However, the estimates from these studies don't seem to fully um, compensate for the large reduction in, in unexpected reduction in smoking that we have observed. 
So did was e-cigarette availability, um, could that explain this large reduction in use smoking? Um, so e-cigarette MLSAs then affect e-cigarette availability. Uh, um, and so their adoption can be used as a natural experiment to study the effect that e-cigarette availability has on, on, on cigarette use. Um, uh, of course, conditional on showing evidence of, of, of parallel trends. Um, so and this is an important question. This, providing evidence on the effect of e-cigarette availability and use smoking is clearly important in FDA regulatory activities. Uh, currently, as the FDA has wide latitude to control e-cigarette availability by approving or denying uh, PMTA applications. So that brings me full circle now to what are the contributions of this particular paper? Um, the, I think the first contribution is to estimate the effect of e-cigarette MLSAs on e-cigarette use in the United States using multiple waves of data. Previous studies just were hampered by data availability and, and could not um, uh, uh, do that. And so this study um, uh, uh, does. We also uh, contribute to and synthesize the effect of e-cigarette availability and use cigarette use using variation e-cigarette availability from e-cigarette MLSA laws. Um, so I produce a new estimate of what effect do e-cigarette MLSAs have on cigarette use. I add that to the existing evidence space to try to produce some kind of average um, effect across all these studies that we think MLSAs are having on use smoking. And uh, the third contribution is I evaluate the effect of e-cigarette MLSAs using recent advancements in difference and differences methods for situations of cigarette adoption. In particular, I use Callaway Santana 2021 estimator. So at this point, I think I'll pause and take uh, any discussion, question, uh, comments and questions from the audience. Thank you, Mike. So let's turn to our discussion first. Dr. Adams, thank you. Yeah, well, Mike, this was a, a pleasure to read this paper. Uh, and I think it, it was time to update the estimates on the effects of uh, the minimum uh, sales laws on both e-cigarettes and smoking, because as you correctly pointed out, the earlier studies were limited in the number of years of data uh, we could look at. So this certainly uh, is a nice addition to the literature at an appropriate time. I also believe that the, uh, we're probably gonna talk a little bit about, about this more, but the uh, utilizing the correction for biases with the uh, staggered treatment uh, adoption in the treatment units. I think that's a good idea uh, in, in this literature in particular, because there are several reasons why biases might exist. Um, I'd like to also add that uh, concurrent to this paper, there's another nice paper that kind of works well with Mike's paper. It's a, a paper forthcoming in the American Journal of Health Economics by uh, Jeff DeSimone, Dan Grossman, and, and Nick Seabirth. Uh, and and they find very similar results, which is encouraging, utilizing a different data set uh, and, a, and different methodology. And I think that the very close nature of the point estimates of both of these studies, I think we're really getting to a point where, uh, and Mike will synthesize the literature a little bit later, getting to the point where, where we do think that these e-cigarette uh, age laws are reducing e-cigarette use, but also on the other hand, uh, perhaps increasing the use of combustible cigarettes. So as far as reducing overall harm, uh, that's certainly a question of, of whether these laws are doing that or not. Uh, I have a few questions um, and clarifications that maybe Mike, you, you can offer. Uh, the first, I don't know if you wanna add any comments about what you think your paper offers uh, or complements the De Simone paper, if you're familiar with it, or any any differences mm -hmm. yours brings in relative contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I definitely am familiar with it. And I do mention it in the back end of the, the presentation um, uh, of, of their paper. Um, they use a, a regression discontinuity design, so different um, a different uh, type of a study. Um, you know, very well done, and I agree that it complements uh, this paper. Um, both papers were kind of came out, they got published around the the, the same time. Um, uh, so they they walk hand in hand with each other, I think. Yeah, and I think uh, they use monitoring the, the future, which mm -hmm. I think is related to 12th graders uh, mm -hmm. in their, their study, which the study Rahi and I did were, well, it was very early on was limited to 12th graders too. And, mm -hmm. and I think up to having these results now be consistent showing that, you know, there is some, they, these products 
do tend to be substituted for each other when it's more difficult to access one or the other. I think we're starting to get to the point where that's probably the established finding. Um, about your particular uh, database, which you're going to talk about in a second, um, so, uh, you know, I, so I think I'll hold off on on asking about the the, the questions related to to uh, the NYTS until a little bit later. But I, I just want to add one particular, uh, you know, clarification. Do we know much about the enforcement of these e-cigarette uh, uh, purchase laws compared to the enforcement of, say? combustible cigarette uh, laws and whether or not they're kind of enforced the same way by state or there's a large variation? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we there's data on it uh, from the CDC state system. Um, they, you know, they have rich data on um, what is actually in these laws in terms of you know, how much are the retailers fined, for example. Um, uh, um, I know licensure plays into this uh, these questions as well, right? And And there's variation in terms of um, which states have uh, required e-cigarette licensure. Um, and, you know, in addition to, I mean, we're focusing on the sales age laws, right? But um, some states also, they have uh, laws uh, affecting purchasing and use, right? Um, so those are two slightly different concepts, right? Um, so the sales ages, these are targeting the retailers, right? But some states also have laws on the books targeting consumers, right? Um, uh, and again, with variation in terms of what are the monetary penalties, um, you know, the, uh, whatnot. Um, so, so I think that there is a lot more work to be done in this space, actually, uh, in terms of unpacking, you know, what are features of these these laws that that make them work uh, uh, better than than others. Okay. Well, that's all I have for now. A lot of my other uh, comments are going to probably make more sense once we see the data and, and the results. So I'll, I'll hold off on some of those for now. Thank you, Scott. We have uh, some audience question. Uh, Mike Cummings asked, uh, have you considered changes in the question wording, which might have changed over time in surveys? Um, in the Urbis, I think he's referring to. Um, oh. I'm not aware. I'm not aware of changes in the question wording. Um, but um, you know, it's it's quite possible. Okay, Urbis, like for e-cigarette use, certainly question the questions would change for for e-cigarette use over time, right? For cigarette use, I'm not sure if there is changes in question wording um, uh, or not. I don't think that there would be, but it's it's possible. Um, and I'm not I'm not sure if there is any changes or not in that. Uh, so James Prager has a clarification question. So uh, in the slides, it does not say anything about the use of cigarettes, but you are going to look at that, right? The cigarettes. The the, the, the what of cigarettes? Uh, the use uh, the use of cigarettes. So uh, yes, I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, I covered some studies that had looked at the effect of the Easter MLSA was on cigarette use, right? Uh, four out of five studies find that they increase uh, cigarette use. And, and I'm gonna further provide a new estimate of that in this paper. Yeah, uh, and one question from Carol Kelly. Are uh, e-hookahs literally hookah water pipes with batteries or AC or is it uh, industry jargon? And are they included in the data and the studies? So this is a definition of e-cigarette use in my opinion. So are ECU e hookahs included in the measurement? Um uh I I you were cutting in and out a little bit. Um uh, so I think the, the question typically that, um, that I end up using in the National Youth Tobacco Survey data, I'm gonna get into what those questions are um uh, in a moment. Um, but basically have youth ever used uh, an e-cigarette? And have they used an e-cigarette over the past 30 days? Um, and so I think youth are largely um, allowed to, you know, self-identify what their youth, their use is um, and what they believe to be an e-cigarette. Um, I also show some descriptive evidence to provide the, the percent of youth that report current use and ever use. Um, so that might give you a sense of, you know, what types of products these youth are considering when they answer the question as well. Uh, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so there is another question regarding the advancement in DD and uh, for the situations of staggered adoption. Uh, could you provide additional explanation for the method and why it is the preferred one in this uh, research? Yeah, I, I am going to do that coming, coming up in the next section. Okay. Uh, so I think we can uh, save the rest questions to later. Okay. 
Thank okay. You. Yep. Okay, so um, the data that I used then is um, National Tobacco Survey data from 2011 to 17. This is a, a nationally representative data source of six to 12th graders. Um, uh, they field the survey in um, uh, not every year, um, especially in the early years. So 2000, 2002, 2004, 2006, 2019, and then they started fielding consistently from 2011 to, to, to 17. And I believe that they've consistently fielded since then. I stopped this study in 2017 because all the states had East or MLSAs in place by, by that uh, point in time. Um, so there are uh, 126,000 respondents under the age of 18 years of age from 2011 to 17. Um, E-cigarette information uh, was added starting in 2011. Um, and then if I go all the way back to 2000, which I have cigarette and cigar information going back to 2000. So I can do a longer kind of evaluation of parallel trends, um, which is, is useful in these study designs. That gives me about a quarter of a million uh, of respondents under the age of 18 years of age. Um, and the data, one consideration is the data is imbalanced. Um, it's collected for between 30 to 42 states per wave. And so that creates some challenges um, uh, that come up in the event studies in particular, and that there's a lot of imbalance in terms of what states contribute in what years, and then also in terms of how frequently the field, the survey is fielded in some of the um, earlier years, uh, ex especially. So that's a data limitation to, to note. Um, and then I use an archive version of the NYTS that includes data identifying information. Um, uh, there, there's a data appendix that I, uh, that's included with the paper that provides further, uh, uh, further information. And um, Scott might have other questions about that that coming up, but happy to answer any questions about that. So the outcomes uh, include um, a, a current past 30 day use of e-cigarettes, cigarettes and cigars. Um, these um, uh, these outcomes, then the current use outcomes are being affected by changes in recent initiation or um, a, a cessation. Um, I also have daily use of cigarettes and cigars, and I have ever use of e-cigarettes. There's no current use, or there's no um, daily use of e-cigarettes, unfortunately, in the uh, NYTS, at least not consistently in the years that I look at, although that might be um, uh, have been added in, in later years. Um, so the ever use of e-cigarettes uh, question, um, it's useful. Um, and indeed, the uh, one of the, the USA-specific um, e-cigarette studies earlier used ever e-cigarette use as well um, to find e-cigarette MLSA was reduced ever e-cigarette use. But what this is what this is reflecting is changes in uh, initiation only. Um, and so in this particular context, studying the effect of e-cigarette MLSAs, um, we're basically um, um, uh, studying the effect that the, the MLSAs have on cumulative changes in initiation. And the NYTS does not provide exact date of initiation that would otherwise provide a more precise measure and be useful. Um, we don't have that, but um, I, I still believe that this is a um, useful uh, variable to use in this analysis, and we're using it the best way that we, we can. There's not a, a more refined data that, that could uh, make this measure better. So um, here's some descriptive uh, statistics, um, ever e-cigarette use. We only have e-cigarette questions from 2011 to 2017. Uh, ever e-cigarette use was reported by 14.2% of respondents, current e-cigarette use by 5.5%. Um, current cigarette use um, from 2011 to 17 was reported by 6.6% of respondents, daily cigarette use by 1.3%, and then current cigar use by 6% and daily cigar use by 0.6%. Um, and then if we go back further for the combustible uh, questions, we find uh, higher rates of, of, of use reflecting uh, combustible use being higher in those earlier years, 10.3%, um, for example, for, for current cigarette use. Okay, so our, our treatment variable then is an e-cigarette MLSA law in, in place at the start of survey year T. Um, the NYTS is all collected in the spring uh, of each year, and so that's why we have the MLSA has to be in place at the start of that 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 year. Um, the controls then we use two-way fixed effects for state and year. Um, there's no sub-state variation available uh, for um, NYTS consistently over this this time, so um, we have to use state uh, uh, fixed effects here and policy variation at the state level. Um, we include demographics of gender, age, race, ethnicity. And then um, uh, for our two-way fixed effect estimates, um, we also include state-specific time-varying controls that would include 
other tobacco control policies, such as taxes, indoor air laws, Tobacco 21, uh, uh, rolled up to the state level, and cigar taxes, um, policies affecting potential substitutes complements, such as beer taxes and marijuana laws, and then economic climate variables, such as minimum wage, poverty rate, and unemployment rate. Problem. Uh, potential bias from stego treatment adoption um, is described by Callaway Santana and Goodman Bacon 2021. Um, so this bias uh, can result in um, earlier adopting ECR MLSA states being poor controls for later adopting states uh, due to dynamic, dynamic treatment effects across adoption timing. And there's also a second way that um, a two-way fixed effect models estimated with stagger adoption can result in a bias. Um, and that is due to giving greater weight to jurisdictions that implement ECR MLSAs around the midpoint of the, of the panel. Um, so this is a conversation that uh, econometricians have been having, and it's been kind of seeping through the economics literature. And, and um, um, the great thing is that there is a solution. Uh, Callaway Santana provided, and other estimators are available as well. This is the one that I use this particular paper. Um, uh, there's a package available in Stata. Um, one of the limitations is that um, uh, it's uh, you can't use state-specific time-varying controls when using the CS uh, uh, estimator, and so um, I uh, do not uh, have the ability to, to control for that. But I do control for those for in our two-way fixed effect models, and I show results across a variety of different um, estimators, two-way fixed effect, Callaway, Santana, and then including different sets of, of controls with the results relatively consistent across uh, estimation um, a strategy. So to illustrate that first um, uh, uh, issue that I mentioned earlier, adopting ECR MLSA states being poor controls for later adopting states, um, here's a, a figure that tries to illustrate the problem. Um, and you can imagine there is um, a, a, a two a state a sample here. Um, and um, if we want to um, estimate an effect between uh, periods uh, a zero and um, a one, um, then um, the, uh, the, this seems fine. I mean, we have evidence of, of parallel trends. Um, the levels are even the same, which wouldn't be needed, but the, 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 the trends are parallel in the pre-period and there's some kind of post-period effects so that we can, um, our difference in difference estimator then is returning the difference between blue and orange in the second period of time versus the difference that's zero between blue and orange in the first period of time. And that provides a difference in difference estimator, right? However, then if we were trying to use that earlier treated unit, the blue unit as a control for orange to adopt between periods one and two, um, that's going to be problematic because uh, blue has there, uh, there's dynamic treatment effects here, and blue is the outcome has been changed as a result of that earlier treatment, right? And so um, we do not have parallel trends, right? And that's going to affect our difference in difference estimator then, because if we take the level difference between orange and blue in the um, uh, to the right of the the second horizontal line, and compare that to the change between blue and orange to the left of the horizontal line that second difference will be biased by this non-parallel trends and, and, and that causes problems. So the idea then is it's it's a mistake to use earlier treated units as controls for later treated units because of the potential that those earlier treated units were set on a different path that causes a violation of the parallel trends assumption. And that's what the Callaway-Santana estimator attempts to, to resolve. So I think I'll take a pause there uh, and have another round of comments and questions. Thank you, Mike. So Dr. Adams, do you want to weigh in if you have any questions? Yeah, just a, a question uh, now about the data set, the NYTS. It is true and that it is representative at the national level, um, but it the way it's fielded, and you know, you may have a little more information. And the way I field it is, I, I believe it's it, they field it based on county and then school, so you don't end up with necessarily a representative sample by state. Now, that may cause an issue, may not cause an issue. I, I know it's been utilized a number of times before to use kind of this cross-state variation, but it, it certainly is a limitation 
uh, of this particular data set. Mm-hmm. Not a not a limitation that I would say, not a fatal limitation, but but one that you know we should continue to explore and and verify in other data sets. That's why it's good that this is being shown in multiple different data sets. But it's a a limitation that that probably should be noted. Yeah, uh, noted. Um, and I agree. Um, uh, there, I mean, there are, you know, the other data set, I guess, that monitoring the future, I think, is in the same bucket, right, of it being yeah. a nationally representative data source. But I mean, people used it for policy evaluation, uh, a, a research. Um, so, you know, it's it's not ideal. It's better to have state representative data I mean, when we're doing perfect. state policy evaluation, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these that are just sort of collected this way end up. So yeah, it's it's good that just to keep showing it with multiple data sets, which mm-hmm. you do. Well, the it, other mm-hmm. early, earlier years, I, I think the NYTS oversampled uh, racial minorities. Uh, and so I know you don't have these in the slides, but I know you have the in the paper, you do use the sampling weights uh, and show that the results mm-hmm. don't change, but the results you're showing us now don't have the sampling weights. That's right. The baseline results don't, um, but I do show sensitivity to using the NYTS provided survey weights and, and the results were very consistent. Yeah, I, saw, I just made the method. I, I wonder if that was just a, was that a choice just for simplicity or was it a methodological choice given these new estimators? That, is it for some reason the sampling weights, don't, do they not work as well with, with the new estimator that you're utilizing or do we know that? Um, uh, hmm. I, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think that the, I think that the estimator, the Kelly Santana, I think it can, can use, um, can use weights. Um, I think it's just, you know, there's questions, you know, in economics, should we, what, what are we waiting for? Right. Yeah. There's no, that famous paper yeah, in Journal of Human heard. Resources. And so I, I think, um, you know, if the, if we could control for all the things on the right hand side that the. Uh, that are used in the construction of the weights, then using the weights shouldn't matter, right? right. Um, <clears throat> in this case, I don't know if I have all of the, I would have to look to see what what are all the factors that the NYTS uses in weights. And it's possible that I don't have, you know, some of those variables likely even, right? Um, so there could be some extra gain to be had from using, um, uh, uh, from using the weights. Um, but I think, you know, if you can show results are insensitive to using them or not, you know, then uh, that that's an ideal situation. Yeah, no, in which you you definitely do. I'm always just curious, re- researchers thinking is when they go with and mm-hmm. decide or not. The other thing I know they have in uh, in the NYTS is smokeless tobacco use. I know you 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 use cigars, which is kind of a, a low frequency outcome. Was smokeless tobacco even less frequency, or did you just not? think of looking at that this time that's that's a good question um i wonder if there was um if there there may have been more variation in terms of the questions uh, the smokeless questions that they asked uh, over time okay. and so um so maybe i just wasn't sure i could develop as consistent of a, of an outcome uh whereas you know cigarettes cigars and, and e-cigarettes i think it was pretty consistently collected over this uh, these time periods they change the quote. Yeah, because I noticed in the NYTS, you start looking and they have all these different products that they're listing, like Snooze and, and all of these other things mm-hmm. that you really know what your index, what you can actually list. Okay, so I'll, I just have a couple more questions, but I'll hold off on those for the re- once you present the results. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I think there is a uh, audience question that's related. Uh, Norbert Schmidt asked, are there any data that could show how the changes in ML, MLSA have affected use smoking combustible tobaccos. So I think this is related to the data source questions. Um, so in addition to what you use here and the uh, monitoring in the future, are there any other data sources that you can think of? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the da- I think the data that has largely been used, a well-known data source that could be used for this question now is the path. Right um, at the time uh, when all these other studies were coming out, we couldn't use the path because they didn't have state identifying information. But now they release state identifying information, so that would be you know somebody should jump on that and you know connect these laws to path data and and, and re explore um, uh, re explore you know what effect it has in e cigarette use on combustible use on smokeless use to Scott's point. Um, uh, so I think that's the obvious one. Otherwise, I think um, you know the data has been pretty well. Uh, utilized uh, that I'm aware of. I mean, we have N- National Survey on Drug Use and Health. We have 
Yerbis, um, we have um, monitoring the future, and now NYTS, right? Um, so th those are four data sets that have been that have now looked at this, um, and I think PATH is the only one I'm really familiar with that um, hasn't been used yet. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question from Boram Lee. Um, Asking, could you provide more explanation about marijuana law variable? Uh, we have um, a medical marijuana uh, laws, and we have recreational marijuana laws. Um, you know, there there could be some concern that um, you know if you change availability of marijuana um, in a given state at a given point in time, uh, maybe that could cause some substitution. Um, I guess from kids using tobacco to using marijuana, or maybe it leads to a you know gateway style relationship in which they start marijuana and now they smoke. So so just to kind of reduce concern about that being a source of a bias, we control for that. Um, uh, I think the paper has a really nice data appendix in which we specify where we get the sources for um, uh, where the, the 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 databases come from that we use for the law effective dates for these types of things. Thank you, Mike. Those are all the questions we have for now. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Um, let's jump into the results then. Um, so uh, ever e-cigarette use, again, this is capturing cumulative initiation. Um, uh, and um, Callaway-Santana estimators are provided on the left. The traditional two-way fixed effect estimators are provided on the right. Again, this is using data from 2011 through 2017, because that's when e-cigarette um, uh, questions first became available in the uh, NYTS. Um, and it, it looks to be about um, a, a two percentage point uh, reduction in ever e-cigarette use to maybe as high as a 3.5 percentage point of, of, of reduction in ever e-cigarette use as a result of e-cigarette uh, MLSA um, uh, laws. Um, it was 15 percent ever e-cigarette use. So uh, that, that would be your, your baseline. Um, Breaking it down, uh, these are Callaway-Santana estimators sent by different demographic groups. Um, looks pretty similar effects among males and females. Um, some evidence then that under 16-year-olds, they were more impacted than uh, greater than 16-year-olds. And I think that that makes sense for this particular question being ever e-cigarette use because it's capturing cumulative changes in cumulative initiation as a result of the e-cigarette MLSA law, right? Um, and so since fewer under 16 year olds have initiated yet, there's a higher pool of potential people you could impact their uh, their initiation on, right? Um, and so I think it makes sense for this particular unusual ever e-cigarette use measure uh, that you would see larger effects for uh, under uh, for younger uh, uh, individuals who, um, because you're more likely to catch them before they initiate. So then jumping to um, daily uh, a cigarette use, um, uh, I show Callaway Santana estimators again, including now I have data going back through 2000, right? Um, so the first two estimators use data just through um, uh, 2011, um, but then the last three um, uh, uh, coefficients are using data going all the way back to 2000. Um, uh, and pretty consistent evidence here of daily cigarette use um, uh, increasing by about 0.5 of uh, 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 percentage points as a result of, um, as a result of the ECR MLSA loss. And in terms of heterogeneity, um, using Callaway Santana estimator, um, uh, some evidence then of larger effects for, um, of, of for males than for females, um, uh, and for possibly older teenagers rather than younger teenagers. Um, and this would be consistent with, um, tobacco use of uh, uh, patterns and, and rates of use being higher among these groups of individuals. Daily cigar use, um, again, same kind of setup as what I just showed for, for cigarette use. The first two estimates are using the 2011 to 2017 time period. Um, uh, these suggest a, a modest increase of about 0 0.2 percentage points. Um, if we start using the two-way fixed effect estimators, um, going back through 2000, um, we, we, we don't see uh, evidence of uh, effects. Um, I guess I consider the Calvary Santana to be, to be a preferable estimator. Um, and, and so I'm inclined to um, give more weight to the, um, to the positive uh, effect that ECR MLSA laws had on daily cigarette use, um, though those two-way fixed effect uh, uh, estimates um, uh, being null um, a challenge that. 
So current use, um, I didn't show you those uh, uh, figures, um, but current use estimates for cigarettes and cigars and e-cigarettes are all statistically insignificant and relatively small. Um, so there's some, this is similar to evidence that we're seeing in the e-cigarette tax literature, um, that current use margins respond relatively imprecisely to policy changes, but ever in daily use margins respond more precisely. So what could be a possible reason for that? I wonder if, if there's some, um, if there is more likely to be recall bias affecting current use measures. Um, and if I think of a given uh, behavior, and if I have done that over the past 30 days or not, um, if it's an infrequent behavior, I might not be sure if I done it over the last 30 days, or if the last time I did it was greater than 30 days ago. So I think that these past 30 day measures, um, they're particularly susceptible to people not really remembering accurately if they used a product within the past 30 days or not. Whereas I think it's a lot easier for people to answer accurately if they've ever used a product or if they used a product daily, right? Um, I think that recall uh, should, be, uh, should be limited. Um, in, in those situations where it's current use to recall could be um, a more problematic. So that could potentially uh, uh, explain some of the um, uh, some of the null uh, effects on current use. Now, in terms of talking about the event studies, uh, these are sometimes noisy, um, uh, uh, admittedly, um, for a few potential reasons. Um, uh, tr there's traditional event study imbalance and that some states do not contribute to each event period's time bin, depending on when they adopted their MLSA. Um, uh, uh, early adopters versus late adopters, um, uh, th th those states will contribute to different event study coefficients given um, the window of time in which the study is performed in, um, and that could cause uh, some, some uh, of this noise. Um, there's also imbalance. I think the primary source of imbalance balance is coming from different states being surveyed in different time periods. And then um, the NYTS not being collected annually prior to 2011 uh, is also a potential concern. So despite this, I think it's fair to say, despite noise and that not being ideal, um, I think it's fair to say that there is not a monotonically increasing or decreasing policy lead coefficients over time. We just see a lot of oscillation um, uh, below and above the, um, the x-axis basically in our event studies. And so uh, that um, uh, is good um, in that um, I'm not seeing obvious evidence of parallel trends violation, though uh, uh, more noise than would be preferable. And so here's forever e-cigarette use. Um, and I guess I find it reassuring that the post-period coefficients, these are all negative, right? And I found in my, my Callaway Santana, my two-way fixed effect estimates, I found those the e-cigarette MLSA laws reduced ever e-cigarette use. So the post-period event study coefficients are consistent with that. In the pre-period, um, uh, that positive coefficient at negative two, that's not, not ideal. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of hard to think of, uh, see like a consistent trend upward or trend downward in these three pre-period coefficients that we have available that would suggest um, uh, 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 policy endogeneity or or some other um, omitted variable, time bearing omitted variable uh, in the model. For cigarette use, um, also some evidence of oscillation uh, above and below the x-axis um, for, uh, for daily cigarette use. Um, in the post period, the coefficients are all uh, positive. Uh, some of them are statistically significant positive. And again, that um, uh, reflects fairly well the the overall Callaway-Santana estimate that um, that we observed of daily cigarette use increasing by 0 0.5 percentage points as a result of e-cigarette MLSA loss. So um, the results were relatively incentive to the following using NYTS survey weights, dropping five states to county level MLSAs, predating state MLSAs, um, and then um, dropping uh, different state year pairs that had an MLSA occur within a given NYTS survey year rather than, um, uh, rather than uh, being in place before, um, and for four state year pairs with statewide, district-wide tobacco 21 loss in place. Um, so reassuring that our results are not driven by these considerations. So uh, discussion. So uh, one of the benefits of this study is to provide the first estimate showing that e-cigarette MLSAs reduce e-cigarette use using multiple years of data. Um, uh, so we find evidence on the cumulative initiation effect and that being reduced as a result of the e-cigarette MLSA loss. And the Desiree Grossman-Zebarth paper that we talked about earlier 
Um, they used a regression to kind of redesign. This was concurrent work to this paper. And they also find that e-cigarette MLSAs reduce underage current and regular e-cigarette use for 12th graders. Um, and the study provides evidence that e-cigarette MLSA was increased daily smoking among youth. Um, and this could suggest e-cigarette availability may have public health benefit in reducing more harmful combustible tobacco use among kids. So let's synthesize the evidence that we know then on MLSAs. Um, and this is a made analysis of two-way fixed effect estimates um, uh, that uh, uh, provide evidence of parallel trends. Um, and it overall finds that e-cigarette MLSAs increase current teen cigarette use by 5.7%. Um, um, so all of the studies make contributions. This is a very healthy body of literature, um, uh, in my opinion, and you have a dispersion of different estimates. And uh, based on the, the sizes of the confidence intervals, they get different weight in the, the meta-analysis, right? Um, and um, uh, the um, some of the studies have greater weight than, than others, right? But the weights aren't being driven at all by what the coefficients are. They're being driven by the, the confidence intervals and how precise those are, right? And so if we kind of take into consideration the coefficients and the, um, the, um, the confidence intervals, we derived that of uh, the e-cigarette MLSA law increasing current teen cigarette use by 5.7%. And unfortunately, my study that I just showed you gets the lowest weight of all six studies. So uh, that's unfortunate. But I guess one contribution is that I get to summarize this, this body of work and I get to um, I got I got to show that first stage relationship uh, possibly better than other studies have been able to, to do. So um, E-cigarette MLSAs, tax rates, advertised restrictions are all shown to reduce e-cigarette use. This is connecting the e-cigarette MLSA literature to some other natural experiment uh, uh, studies and what do we know from these. Um, and so of these three policies, um, there's 16 fixed effects studies have explored the effects. Uh, 14 find that the policies increase cigarette use. Um, uh, one finds no relationship and one finds that the policies reduce a, a cigarette use. So that's a that's a pretty um, interesting, uh, a robust body of work now around uh, e-cigarette availability, which can be restricted by policies, um, reducing uh, uh, reducing cigarette use. And these studies seem to be explicitly validated by use smoking rates falling um, uh, more than predicted during a decade with high e-cigarette availability. So. Um, these 16 studies evaluate the effect of e-cigarettes as consumer products using real-world data. Um, uh, that's real nice contribution. Um, uh, and they, they match well evidence from randomized controlled trials. These are of medical e-cigarettes, right? And in Cochrane, they find that medical e-cigarettes in trials have been shown to improve clinical smoking cessation, right? So the natural experiments showing the effect of e-cigarettes as commercial products and finding similar results to the RCTs fight of medical e-cigarettes, um, uh, that's that's interesting, uh, that connection and how consistent the evidence is across them. So I think that um, I will uh, stop there because I know we have time for, um, we need time for discussing comments and questions. And I'll leave, leave this up for just kind of comparing this body of work to longitudinal cohort uh, study designs. Thank you, Mike. Very interesting results. So before we turn the discussion to Scott, uh, here's a question from Mike Cummings about uh, the e-cigarette questions in NITS, as well as other tobacco products like cigars or hookah. So the questions change between 2014 and 15. A study found that the change format for asking about e-cigarette likely caused the 2015 estimate to be higher than what would have been predicted in 2014. And there were study documenting that. Would you say, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Th thanks, Mike, for, for uh, pointing that out. So we do, um, uh, so we do include, um, you know, your, your fixed effects, you know, in the model, right? So, um, so, you know, the your fixed effects should, in theory, control for anything changing in the survey from one year uh, uh, to the other. So that, that can help, you know, address this issue. Um, I mean, ideally, the questions would be consistent, but oftentimes questions change, you know, survey year over survey year, and we try to create consistent measures as much as we can. Um, but hopefully we can 
implement reasonable controls to make sure that this isn't influencing our results too much. Thank you. So, Scott, do you have some uh, discussion questions? Um, just, just one yeah. final. Just one yeah, final. Thank you. So, so I think it's, you did a nice job synthesizing the literature. It certainly looks as if uh, when you make e-cigarettes more difficult to get uh, by by imposing the, the legal sales age, people move and are going to consume more combustible cigarettes. I think my question in general that we maybe need to investigate more is the mechanism, right? So it's because if e-cigarettes are now illegal for kids, cigarettes were always illegal for kids. Both are now illegal. So why are they finding it easier than to buy more combustible cigarettes? Is it easier to borrow those from friends? Is it easier to get them in a, from another source? And I think some of these data sets do have questions that will allow us to get at that. So mm -hmm. I kind of encourage someone, not me, uh, to maybe give that an investigation at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Scott. And, and um, you know, I think there's a lot of work to, remains to be done in this this space. There's a lot of data uh, sources that are available that permit these types of uh, types of studies. So um, so uh, I'm all, I'm all for that. Um, I guess you know we did look with uh, when we were looking at uh, e-cigarette taxes on youth um, the, uh, it, within the Yerbus data. They do have questions then on how youth obtained their their e-cigarettes, and we found some evidence that you substituted from retail based sources of e-cigarettes to social sources of, of e-cigarettes. Um, the Yerbis started asking e-cigarette questions in 2015, so we don't have too much variation in e-cigarette MLSA laws, right? Um, but there might be something that could be used to, to get at um, how the laws change where you obtain their e-cigarettes from. Thank you, Mike. Uh, there are many audience questions, so I'll try to combine them. Uh, so Alan Brennan is asking, how do you interpret the 5.7% relative effect in youth smoking? And uh, if youth smoking is now 6%, uh, does that mean that 60% times 0.0574, uh, that lead to a 0.3% of the whole youth population will start smoking? Uh, so like the interpretation okay. of the okay. findings. Um, for the first one, um, yeah, you can triple check. Uh, if a state puts an e-cigarette MLSA in place, they make it harder to buy e-cigarettes. They restrict e-cigarettes, right? It increases smoking by 6%. That, that, is, uh, that is correct. Um, then the second question, um, I'm, let's see. Sorry, I just... Uh, that's okay. I can find it here. Um, uh, if you smoke, it's not 6%. So that's uh, um, so you yeah so it's, so I talked at some points in the presentation I talked percentage point changes right which is you know if you had a ten percent smoking rate and you add a one percentage point to it right that would give you eleven percent smoking rate this case I'm talking six percent as um, that would be um, uh, six take whatever the smoking rate is and then multiply that by um, 1.06, right? And then that's what, what you would get for the new smoking rate as a result of e-cigarette MLSCs. Yeah. So question from Cheryl Olson. So across studies, including yours, do these results suggest that nicotine use among youth is more or less stable? Are public health goals better served uh, by concentrating prevention efforts on combustible products? Um, you know, I think that's a uh, that's I mean that's a really interesting question. Um, like, how is nicotine use changing? Uh, uh, because or how is nicotine consumption changing? Right. I mean, we have use questions, right? Um, but I mean, you know, the kind of the the um, that that's really not capturing um, very good information about like how regularly are people using products, how deeply are they inhaling different products, um, you know, how much nicotine is in the different products themselves, right? Um, uh, so some crude measure like nicotine use over the past 30 days, any, right? Like that really doesn't, um, I don't think that rubric kind of serves public health goals as much as we might be better served by, um, you know, at least knowing like how much cotinine, you know, levels uh, do, do, do youth have reflecting all possible uses of many different types of products and and how they're being used exactly. Um, but I mean, but overall, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, nicotine isn't really, you know, my understanding is that nicotine has very minimum public health costs, right? It's it's the tar and the carbon monoxide, right, that, that are um, the more 
uh, dangerous, uh, uh, far more dangerous parts of uh, tobacco products, right? And so, you know, maybe, you know, our, our efforts should be focused on how do we reduce carbon monoxide exposure and, and tar uh, exposure. It seems like that might lead to better uh, public health outcomes than focusing on, on, on nicotine. But if we are focusing on nicotine, at least let's focus on it in the correct way, right? And I'm not convinced that past 30 day use of any tobacco product, that's really capturing you know, nicotine use in a very useful way. Uh, so there are several questions left. I think we can get to a few of them. So one question from Samuel uh, Asar asking, considering daily use in percentage terms, can we conclude that the policy increases cigar uh, or cigarette use more than the decrease in e-cigarette use in general? Mm -hmm. Do you also mm -hmm. do meta-analysis for e-cigarette use? I don't do that, uh, uh, Sam, because um, uh, we don't have a lot of estimates of the effect of MLSA laws on e-cigarette use right now. It'd be great to get more estimates of that, and then we could do the made analysis, right? This is the first multi-year uh, uh, USA study that could look at that, right? Um, uh, but if we have five or six, then we can do a made analysis. I mean, the um, uh, the the ever use rate right, was reduced by by more than the increase in 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 daily use, but again, that's that's like comparing two very different things, right? So it's hard to draw um, a direct comparison in terms of which one increased relatively more than the other one. Thank you. I think one last question uh, from Mike Cummings. Uh, have you evaluated the cost of enforcing uh, minimum legal age laws? Um, um, I have I have not, but I think that you know that's very. Those are very interesting questions um, uh, that we could unpack these MLSAs, right? Um, we, we're just treating them very crudely currently by considering whether a state has one in place or not and not considering at all, you know, enforcement um, dollars that are put into these laws, um, how retailers are fined. Um, and the CDC state system does have a lot of information available that would let us get into the nuts and bolts of how these laws operate. So I think that there's a great paper there for, for somebody. Thank you very much. We have two questions left, but I think I'll forward those questions to you. And thank you very much. We're out of time. Let's turn uh, this to our MC today. Catherine, thank you. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 167 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend. <laughs>